Slasherholics. This is R.A. Mahailov, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Keep watching the 80s Slasher Librarian. The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 16 By the time she had found her way out of the main hall and into the loading dock area, Aaron's mind was in tatters. If she had prevailed against the countless attacks that had been thrown at her, it was because she had fought like the enemy. She had become a thing that had hacked off a man's arm with a meat cleaver. She had screamed and dismembered him, letting him dehumanize her almost as much as if he had stolen her face. But within that terrible realization, a crumb of the original Aaron Hardesty still survived, and she fled, looking for the rainbow that would transport her back to her own life, to a world of innocence where the worst thing a man could do was to smuggle a piñata full of cannabis over the Mexican border. For sure, there was a part of Aaron that was still pure and untouched, but right now that part was comatose. She paused for a moment to see, to listen, if he was coming. But all she could hear was the grunting and murmuring of the animals, even the chainsaw was silent, which meant he must have been sneaking up after her again. Aaron had no idea how beaten he was. Crying, gripping his stump, a foot lashed out and kicked at the motionless power tool, and he sat there, head slumped in a pool of his own blood. The way out of the loading dock was blocked by a massive roll-top door. At first, she ran down to the foot of the shutter and tried to lift it, but, although the horizontal metal segments rippled and clattered in time with her efforts, the door remained firmly in place. Leatherface still hadn't caught up with her. She ran to the far side of the door and found a switch box mounted on the wall. There were two big round plastic buttons on the control unit, one red, one green, hardly an intelligence test. Aaron thumped the green button and watched eagerly as the door slowly began to rise like an armored curtain. Her eyebrows twitched and the cleaver was shaking in her right hand, but her face was a picture of manic joy. She had come through another labyrinth intact. First the Hewitt Place, then the old house on the prairie, and finally the godforsaken slaughterhouse. She had had enough of walls and now wanted nothing more than to be moving again. She wanted fresh air wanted a car on the open highway. She wanted freedom. The first thing she noticed when she stepped out of the meat processing plant was that the sun was rising. My God, she'd spent almost 24 hours there. The new dawn was the first clear measure of how much time had elapsed since they'd stopped to pick up the teenage girl. Aaron was appalled to think she'd spent a whole day running and fighting for her life in this Texan insane asylum. Yet she was amazed that only one day had passed. It had felt like whole lifetimes in slow-motion purgatory. The second thing Aaron noticed was that the sky was pouring with rain. She was already drenched with sweat, blood, and the water from the slaughterhouse sprinklers, but this rain was from God. It was fresh, pure, cleansing, and she was only too happy to let it fall down on her as she staggered outside. She wasted no time. She ran straight across the dusty parking lot, then sprinted along a dirt road that led back up to the highway. But after a few flagging minutes on the road, Aaron slowed to a clumsy jog, then down to a dazed walk. 
Her eyes darted in all directions, looking for Hewitt, watching for the sheriff's car, almost expecting to see Henrietta's trailer, but ultimately seeing no one and nothing but open prairie. And suddenly she was overwhelmed. No longer in immediate danger, Aaron almost collapsed beneath a landslide of exhaustion. She had been awake nearly all day. She had been running, fighting. She had been living solely on her wits. Now that she could unwind, her body demanded time to heal. She ached all over. She was beat and badly needed sleep, and her mind was a jumble, a highly strung confusion of nightmarish images and denial, refusing to accept that what she'd seen today was even possible. The meat cleaver fell from her hand. It hit the road with a dull clang, but she ignored it and carried on walking. Her hands and arms hung limp by her side. She had to bring all of her willpower to bear, just to keep moving. She had to concentrate. One foot in front of the other. One foot. Got to keep moving. One more step, and another, and another. The young woman had become so ravaged and disoriented that it never once occurred to her. She was heading back along the road in the direction of Mexico. Sure, the border was a couple of hundred miles away, but every step she took was undoing the progress she'd made yesterday. With her friends and the Chrysler Dodge, not that she would have cared. The one thing she did know about the route she was taking was that it was away from the slaughterhouse, away from Luda May's hovel, and away from the Hewitt place. Aaron laughed, and then she cried, her feet walking along the center of the road, bewildered, lost, her mind in jagged shards. Reflecting, reflecting pieces of memory of the teenage girl in the summer dress. All her life, Aaron had wanted to be someone like that, walking alone, chased by shadows, a crazy hitchhiker. All her life, she'd waited for this moment, hadn't she? And what would happen after Aaron? Would there be another crazy girl walking along the road, and another, and another? No, wait, wait, wait. She couldn't be like the teenage girl because there was no one out here to pick her up. How could she be a crazy hitchhiker if she couldn't get a ride? Oh God, she wanted so bad to be home right now. Dallas was like a distant... Where'd the... Wait. Where'd the cleaver go? She thought she heard a vehicle coming. Aaron checked her clothes. She was still wearing her tank and her flared jeans, all dirty, torn, and covered in blood, and her shoes were busted. But no summer dress, so she couldn't be the crazy hitchhiker, and she didn't have a gun. She just had her wild hair and the fear in her eyes. The noise was getting close now. It was definitely an automobile engine of some kind. Low, rumbling. Sounded like a truck. Rhymed with... The big rig came powering along the highway, taking the quiet back route off the interstate. Bob had done this road many times, took at least an hour and a quarter of the journey, and less chance of being caught gear jamming. He was doing 85, which was good for a haulage truck of this size, but then the diesel was a triple digit ride. It was raining, he had the wipers on full, but the sun was coming, so visibility was okay. The roads through here were so damn straight, the only thing you got to look out for were some of the dips. Some of the grades could catch you out if you didn't pay close enough attention. Bob took a sip of coke and wiped his mouth. Yep, the truck was going down one of the grades right now. He hit the gas, ready for the gentle upstroke, then drove straight back up the... What the? There was someone walking plain right in the middle of the road. He hit the horn. She wasn't going to move. Quickly, he squeezed on the brakes, gently enough to stay out of a skid, but firmly enough to avoid knocking whoever it was flat dead. He wrenched the wheel and pulled over to the shoulder, making sure he didn't even clip the girl as he rolled by. The engine stopped. Looked like a young woman in a pretty bad way. Acted like she didn't even see him, just kept walking, staring straight ahead. Bob put on the handbrake, then climbed down from the gleaming high cabin. He was a well-built guy in his 40s, but he moved toward the girl with the care and concern of a family man rather than a hard-nosed trucker. Hey there. He called. You okay? Flashback. She'd said almost exactly the same thing to the dead teenager. 
Only then, Aaron had been the one inside the vehicle, and it was the teenager who needed to escape. Aaron stopped. She turned, looked at Big Rig Bob, and said something he couldn't quite hear. You in a wreck? He asked her. He could see she was in severe trauma, so he moved very slowly and spoke as softly as an ace trucker could. Then carefully, very carefully, he placed a gentle hand on her arm and helped her back towards the truck. Aaron flinched and drew a sharp intake of breath, but she saw his face, smiling, trying to be calm, reassuring, and she saw his truck. A truck, a way out of here. So she let him help her on board, and just sat shaking in the passenger seat as he closed the door for her, then mounted up himself and got the rig underway. Bob was sure she'd been in an automobile incident of some kind. You could be in an accident out here and not be picked up for hours. She was damn lucky he was scheduled to come along like that. He looked at her. Guess she was what, 30, 35? Difficult to tell underneath all that dirt, and she stank awful, like a farm during muck spreading. Where are we going? It was the first time that she'd spoke. Almost caught him by surprise, but he kept his eyes on the road. Gonna get you some help. He said firmly, Help, help. Aaron felt more tears welling in her eyes. The horizon burned with the red dawn of a new day, and despite the rain, the landscape was awash with gold and scarlet hues. Aaron had every reason to feel safe now. She was with someone, someone who could protect her, and they were driving away. Nothing could stop them now. Nothing. Not Hewitt with his goddamn chainsaw, not that legless freak in the fucking wheelchair, or the retarded bitch in the trailer. None of them. Not even that sadistic son of a bitch sheriff. Who was to say Hoyt was even a real lawman anyway? Bob didn't know what to make of the woman. Any second now, he kept expecting to see the wreck of an automobile, but so far he'd seen nothing. She must have walked quite a few miles before he'd found her. He saw a sign by the side of the road, Big Cow Barbecue. Call it the power of suggestion, but his stomach rumbled, and hey, it was getting on for breakfast time. The girl started crying beside him. In fact, she was weeping, getting hysterical. Heck, he needed to get her someplace, and get her there soon. Honey, what's your name? He asked, hoping to shake her out of it. I want to go home. She cried. Do you live around here? Maybe she hadn't been in a crash after all, but then... What? No answer. Bob sighed and reached into his breast pocket for a cigarette. Lit it up. He'd seen accidents before. You couldn't spend as many years on the road as he had without seeing a whole lot of wreckage. Never could understand why people were scared of flying when you see so many dead bodies on the highway every day. But there was something about this girl that wasn't quite adding up. They're all dead. Another memory. Another flashback. The words were the suicidal girls, but the voice was Aaron's. Misery was repeating itself in Travis County. Her words scared the hell out of him. Who? But she didn't answer, which unsettled him even more. No problem. He was about to get some help. Bob had done this route so many times. He knew every stop, diner, and bar along the way. And he remembered that just about a couple hundred yards past the barbecue sign, there was a hillbilly general store or something. He'd never been inside before, but he knew it was there, and he reckoned it would be a good place to stop and get some help. No, not possible. Aaron leaned forward and saw Luda May's general store in the near distance, and it was getting closer. He had taken her back. The idiot had taken her back. No! She screamed, and then she was at him, kicking and punching. She scratched his hands and tried to grab hold of the steering. It was the crazy hitchhiker and Kemper all over again, and Aaron would do anything, anything to save the trucker from becoming another desiccated mask in Hewitt's sick collection. You can't make me go! 
She raged, struggling at the will. Bob couldn't believe how strong she was. She fought like a hellcat. But if he didn't do something about it, they'd probably jackknife, and with the truck as bundled out as it was, it would not be pretty. Get the hell off me! He shouted, and he pushed her back into the passenger seat. She leaned forward again, but he managed to hold her down, keeping the rig under control with his other hand, while slowing on the approach to the general store. Take me home! She shouted. She was begging him, begging him, but all she'd done was piss him off like some kind of vicious little crazy woman. I don't know what the hell your problem is. He rattled. But it's more than I can handle. Aaron curled up in her seat and cried. He was breaking, getting ready to turn right into the dirt lot outside Luda Mays. It wasn't possible. What the fuck was he doing? Suddenly, she caught a glimpse of herself in the rear view. Oh, God. She looked again. Those eyes, that face, the dirt blood, her hair. How pale was she? The dark rings. She was the teenage girl after all. The crazy girl who shot herself rather than go back to this place. Erin reached out and touched the silver glass, tracing the lines on her reflected image, trying to see if there was anything about the girl in the mirror she still recognized. They were almost there now. The old gas pump, the yard cell, the used tires and auto spares, Erin could remember it all. Only there was something else outside the general store building right now. A police car. Sheriff Hoyt. Screamed Aaron, and she threw herself across at the trucker and hit him with everything she had. The truck had already decelerated most of the way, but Bob couldn't keep hold of the wheel. He hit the brakes, but the rig went sliding past the dirt lot and came to a stop on the highway further on. Not here! Keep going! Please! cried Aaron, and she beat on his chest, her blows becoming more and more feeble her weeping more desolate until she was just gulping air and shivering. This was getting too much for Bob. He wanted to help the woman, but this was more than he could take. She was weird. He took one more look at her tear-streaked face and then climbed out of the rig. She held her hand out towards him. She was drooling and crying, but it was no use. The sooner he got her to a hospital, the better. Bob was almost touching the ground when he realized he'd just done something plain stupid. He shook his head, got back on up, and took the keys out of the ignition. And then he left the truck. It was still raining pretty hard, and the dirt was turning into mush. Bob hunched low and walked quickly across to the store, his boots splashing in the water. Behind him, Erin jumped down from her side of the cab and didn't give a damn about the rain as she looked for a place to hide. She had been safe. She'd escaped. She'd been free. But now here she was again. Here she fucking was again. Was the trucker one of them? Was this all part of the game? Is this how they wanted to finish her off, give her one last false second of freedom, and then squash her like a damn cockroach? Aaron didn't want to be seen prowling out in the rain, but she couldn't help but look on as Bob entered the store. Oh my god, she could see them. The sheriff, Luda May, and Henrietta. What the hell were they all doing so early in the morning? What kind of redneck hillbilly fuck middle of nowhere shop opened at dawn? But she knew the answer already. They were here because she was there. They'd probably left the farmhouse as soon as Morgan and her had broke free. Morgan. Jedediah. Bob went straight to the sheriff and started to talk. And soon all three of them were listening to him. She could see them soaking it all up, hanging on his every word. And when he pointed out the window, they all turned to look at what he was pointing at. They all turned to see the hysterical woman he picked up a few miles back along the road. Aaron bolted behind the cover of the rig. She watched as the four of them shuffled through the store to the open doorway. The screen door remained shut, protecting them from the rain as Big Rig Bob gestured back in the direction of his truck. From his manner, there could be no doubt that he was telling them all about Aaron. And though none of the Hewitts had ever asked her name, they possessed enough cruel cunning to know exactly who the trucker meant. Sheriff Hoyt, in particular, seemed mighty concerned, which was only natural when it was the job of all police officers to handle any emergencies that might occur in their district. Hoyt looked out into the heavy rain and smiled. The rig was parked on the road, about 20 yards in front of his own car, which was on the lot. He couldn't see inside the truck cabin from here but it was going to be a real pleasure to walk over there and tie up some unfinished business. 
Henrietta and Luda May had done a good job of keeping the trucker talking. Bob never once noticed Hoyt sizing him up from behind, just in case. Outside, Aaron had already moved away from the giant vehicle. Although they'd all stood looking through the screen door, the terrified young woman had been able to crawl unnoticed down the length of the rig, and then across to the side of the store building. She threw her back flat against the peeling whiteboard wall, the rain trickling down her face. She didn't know what the hell to do, but there was an open window nearby. If she could just speak up to it, she might at least be able to hear what they were saying. She wasn't thinking too clearly right now, but she couldn't just let herself be captured again. She couldn't give up. She had to think of something. She had to. Clamping a hand over her mouth to stifle her worried breathing, Aaron bent low and sidled her way up beside the window. She could hear them, but their voices were muffled. They were still over by the door. Slowly, she raised her head and peered over the window frame. The window was at the back of the store opening, right above the counter. None of them knew where she was. She could see all of them looking at the rig. The driver kept telling them over and over about how the poor young thing done neatly drove them both off the road. Hoyt kept saying everything was under control. Just then, Aaron heard another voice. The baby. The baby they'd stolen from Jedediah's parents was lying unattended in a bassinet on the counter. The moment Aaron realized this, everything became clear. The Hewitts and their sick world of inherited violence and their depraved cycle of beatings and murder. Poor Jedediah, the son they'd wanted to carry on the family name before they killed him with a fucking chainsaw. Aaron and the teenage girl, both crying for mercy on a remote Texas highway. And now the baby. Suddenly everything became clear and Aaron knew the perfect way to beat them. When she'd attacked Thomas Hewitt, she'd become Thomas Hewitt. Now she had a chance to reclaim her humanity and at the same time to break the chain of death that forever linked father to son in the dank squalor of the Hewitt basement. Hoyt looked outside. If he wanted to get her, he was going to have to get wet. He adjusted his belt, then pushed open the screen door. As long as the two women kept the dumb trucker busy, there'd be no witnesses to what the sheriff said and did. He didn't want to shoot the girl. No, she'd cost them too much to die quick. But if she was going to make a nuisance of herself, then she'd be shot while resisting arrest. Maybe the trucker, too. God damn, where was that dumb prick Leatherface when he was needed? The sheriff stepped out of the store and into the rain, and was annoyed to find Big Rig Bob following straight behind him. Erin ran as fast as she could, her broken shoes slipping in the mud. Back inside the store, Henrietta and Luda May kept watching through the open doorway. They saw Hoyt walk over to the rig with that loudmouth trucker alongside him. The sheriff wasn't going to like that much. Henrietta cast a glance back over at the counter. Her darling little girl had slept like a charm through all the commotion. They'd not heard a peep out of the beautiful... Sweet baby, Jesus! She shouted. The child is gone! Luda May turned and saw that the hooded wicker cradle on the counter was empty. Aaron lay down low on the seat and pulled the Swiss Army knife out of her pocket. The last time she'd done this, she busted two blades, but this was a different ignition in a different vehicle. She was running out of time. She couldn't afford to make a single mistake. They were coming. She could hear their footsteps splashing in the rain. Biting her lips, she dug into the steering column and popped open the ignition casing. Her hands were shaking all over. Quick, the wires! Hoyt reached down and put a hand on the gun in his holster. It wasn't a standard-issue weapon. It was the snub-nose the girl had shot herself with. 
He was standing outside the cabin of the truck. Both doors were closed, and he couldn't hear any movement from inside. So keeping one hand on the revolver, he reached up to open the driver's door but pulled back. He had a better idea. He listened again to make sure she hadn't heard him, then started to walk around to the passenger side where she'd be moaning and whining. The engine was dead and the truck driver had the keys, so Hoyt didn't think twice about walking right out in front of the enormous rig. Her fingers worked frantically at the ignition wires. If she could just... She'd wipe the rain off her hands and had already begun to strip away the sheathing with her army knife. There was just one stubborn piece of casing left. Aaron turned the knife in her fingers and began to chip at the last bit of plastic, when suddenly she slipped and stabbed the cutting tool into her thumb. But she took the pain. It was nothing compared to what she was already feeling. She just kept her mouth shut, let the knife fall to the floor and reached for the exposed leads with her bloodied fingers. All she had to do was make the right connection, and the engine would be up and running. Then, by God, she'd hit the gas. The sheriff passed in front of the cabin and took out the gun from his belt. Big Rig Bob was hanging back around the driver's side so there was no way for the trucker to see what was going on. A callous bastard grin creased its way onto Hoyt's face, the age lines in his skin only half as deep as the booze lines. He was almost at the passenger door. There was no chance of her getting away this time. He wasn't some mule brain retard with the tree cutter. He was a killer with a 25-yard aim. If Luda May had just let him rape the bitch and cut her up with a bourbon bottle like he wanted, she'd have been put to sleep hours ago. But no, they'd had to go and put her down in the basement with all the other hippie student faggots, and she'd busted out with that little freak Jedediah or whatever the brat's name was before Luda May adopted him. But it was all over now. Sheriff Hoyt climbed up, took hold of the passenger door handle, and then raised the gun, ready to shoot the bitch right between her eyes. Then he swung the door open and shouted at her to... The words died in his mouth and he froze. The cabin was completely empty. Hoyt just hung there, holding on to the open door. One foot inside the truck, the rest of his body braced outside. Where the fuck was she? He looked again, but there was no one inside. He looked through over to the store and could see Henrietta and Luda May running straight for him. They were shouting something. They wanted him to come over. Was the girl in there? Hoyt turned his head, ready to step down, and saw his own car speeding straight for him. The patrol car slammed into the sheriff, hitting him full on before crashing through the open passenger door, tearing it clean off the side of the rig. Hoyt fell back and his body smashed against the windshield, creating a mosaic of cracked glass outlined by his seeping blood. Almost immediately, the sheriff bounced off the windscreen and fell onto the ground. His stout body hurled, rolling through the mud. Fragments of broken glass tumbled over the hood of the car and trailed glistening in the vehicle's wake. What was left of the windshield was now smeared with Hoyt's blood. The sheriff couldn't believe what had just happened to him. That face behind the wheel, it was the girl. Aaron had been inside the squad car all along. She hotwired it, got it started, and then ran the sheriff down the first damn chance she got. And she wasn't through yet. She turned the car in a tight 180, her hands gripping the wheel and her face set cold in a thousand yard stare. Luda May and Henrietta were cussing and stamping in the mud and dirt, but Aaron couldn't hear them or have cared less. Neither the fat deranged lunatic or the mad old storekeeper would come after Aaron, nor would the truck driver. No, the only real threat to Aaron now was... Hoyt scrabbled across the ground, trying to find his gun. It had been knocked out of his hand when that bitch had ran into him to where the revolver lay in the dirt. It hurt him to breathe. Reckoned she broke his ribs, but he could still take her out. Gritting his teeth and trying to shake the damned rainwater out of his eyes, he grabbed the gun and rolled over onto his back. He could hear her coming again, the whore. He sat up. She hit the gas, was coming straight for him. His eyes went wide. He raised the gun and aimed for her stupid little face and... Fuck you! Spat Aaron, and she drove the police car straight over his body. 
The vehicle bounced up and down on its suspension as the wheels broke his legs, pulverized his groin, crushed his ribs into his heart and lungs, and burst his head wide open like a fucking overripe melon. Aaron turned on the wipers. There was just too much damn blood on the windshield. Then she was gone. Luda May and Henrietta raged as the car pulled away from the store and tore off down the highway. Their arms flailed wildly, their faces contorted with hatred and sheer bastard insanity. Aaron had stolen their baby, and the rain poured down. There was a flash of lightning in the distance, and Aaron could hear the brooding rumble of thunder overhead. The sky had broken, and the fall had become almost torrential in its ferocity. But the water was purifying the car, washing away the final grubby stains of the sheriff's death. Aaron had won. Ahead of her, the sun was rising above on the horizon, casting more and more glorious light down upon the wide open prairie of Travis County, the new day undiminished despite the storm. Lying in the passenger seat next to Aaron, snuggled in soft rabbit pajamas, was the baby girl. Aaron had snatched the child through the open window of the store, rescuing her from the living homicidal hell of growing up as a member of the Hewitt family. The young woman behind the wheel of the police car had been to the slaughterhouse and back. She'd saved an innocent child, and now they were both on the road to Dallas. Aaron looked grim and determined. She was just passing through. Epilogue. It was difficult to imagine the distraught middle-aged woman before me as the carefree teenager who'd gone with her friends to Mexico 30 years ago. If only half her story was true, it was half too much. All her cuts and bruises had healed a long time ago, but the fact that she was talking to me from within an institution was proof that her mental scars would probably never go away. Now that I'd heard Aaron Hardesty's story, I had even more questions that needed answering. Where was the baby she took? What happened to Luda May, Henrietta, and Monty Hewitt, and just what did happen to Leatherface? On August 19th, she left him seriously injured at the slaughterhouse. On August 20th, Leatherface killed Detective Adams in the basement of the Hewitt house, so where was Leatherface now? I showed Aaron the autopsy photo, and I described to her the photo shown to me by Franklin Nash. They killed the wrong man. She told me, They had a dead man, and that is all they cared about. So they closed the case. I asked her, How do you know it wasn't him? Aaron looked me straight in the eye and said, The bodies in the photos had both arms. He... He only had one. Then I remembered she'd cut off his arm with the cleaver. A one-armed man, an obese one-armed man like the survivor I went to see only a few days ago. The survivor who hadn't spoken since the day he was found. The survivor who compulsively chewed on candy and chocolate. The survivor who had only one arm. There was no other survivor. The man I spoke to three days ago was Leatherface. The end. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. I gotta say, going into this one, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it turned out really good. I like the, you know, the little added story of the reporter doing the story at the beginning, interviewing um, 
turns out he's interviewing Aaron, and we find out who the other person was that he actually had met Leatherface. Uh, so there you go. It was Leatherface that was chewing on the candy and stuff at the beginning of the book. Did not uh, did not see that one coming. Uh, before I go into more uh, review here of the book, I want to again say thank you to all my patrons, and uh, and say thank you to our cast of characters. Aaron was played by Bonanza Jellybean, Morgan by Sean Campbell, Kemper by Stephen Palamo, uh, Big Rig Bob, Christopher Burns Swanson played him, Cat uh, Loveless played Pepper, Liam Anderson played Monty, and William Piccolo played Andy. And uh, that couple lines there at the end was voiced by my wife, Beth. Uh, she did Luda May there, <clears throat> about when the baby got taken. So uh, thank you all so much. Um, I know this book took a while to get out, but right in the middle of narrating this book, I uh, ended up moving. I got married, just a bunch of stuff going on. Slowed it up, but I'll be back very soon. I'm going to be finishing up Event Horizon and starting on Final Destination, Destination Zero. Those are going to be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to that. As far as this book goes, if you want to go back and hear more detailed review on it from me, uh, you can go to the playlist version of the book where I put out like one chapter per upload. And I discuss each chapter in detail after I get through narrating it. But here, uh, for this conclusion, which is also going to be what you hear if you're listening to the unabridged version, I just got to say, Stephen Hand is a great writer. I enjoyed Carnival of Maniacs, the Friday the 13th book he wrote. I thought he did a really good job of getting us into the head of the Hewitt family. Uh, I thought he wrote Leatherface very well. And getting, you know, getting to know some of that psyche and stuff and what was going on in Leatherface's Troubled Mind was really interesting. I really did enjoy that. Uh, I thought he he wrote the sheriff well. He made us care for the characters of the movie a little bit more because in the movie, it just it seemed like it went so fast with them, you didn't really get a chance to know anything about them. And uh, I really enjoyed how the book fleshed them out a lot more. It made their deaths more brutal and uh, sad, I guess. Um, Aaron was written like a real fighter in this one. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, in the movie she fought too, but in the book you really got a feel for her survival instinct kicking in. And uh, her, her is like, what is that, like a whole chapter of just her and Leatherface there at the end, you know? Uh, I thought that was amazing, um, the, way, the way Stephen wrote that out. It really put me in the moment. I felt the intensity. Uh, I, I felt the tension. I felt all of it. I wish there was more Leatherface books, but this is like the only official novelization of any of the Texas Chainsaw films that ever got in book form. Um, so if anybody knows of any like fan fiction ones that have been written, let me know about it. I'll try to get in contact with the person that wrote them and see if I can narrate those, because I'd really love to have more Leatherface content here on the channel, and it's sad that this is the only Leatherface book. Kind of like there's only two Chucky books, Child's Play 2 and 3, and I've already narrated those. Uh, but as far as this book goes, I'll give it a score uh, rating whenever I do the episode with Sean Campbell of Out of Print Slashers podcast in the future when we talk about this book in particular. I'm really looking forward to talking about it because there's a lot i got to say. If you're listening to the unabridged version right now, then like I said, go back to the playlist section and find the individual chapter uploads for this book, and you'll hear me give each chapter a more detailed review. But overall, I really enjoyed all the patrons. You all did an amazing job voicing characters. I thought Stephen Hand took a mediocre movie and made it a very exciting novelization. He gave us the extra story of the reporter being told the story, finding out the reporter met Leatherface. That was a cool twist. Uh, he made Aaron more of a badass. He made us care for the characters more, really flesh those characters and their story out. Uh, he made the Hewitt family more intriguing. Uh, we really got in their mind and their psyche and what makes them tick, and I really loved that. I loved the intensity and the chase scenes and the kill scenes. Uh, I, I was, like, excited when, when Hoyt got ran over and killed, uh, even though I knew it was coming. I was rooting for Aaron to save the baby, and I really enjoyed the backstories on Leatherface, the flashbacks, getting in his head. Uh, you, don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of backstory on Leatherface, and uh, that was really intriguing, and I really, really enjoyed that. So, as far as I'm concerned... Uh, this is one of my favorite books I've narrated so far. It never felt dull. It never slowed down. Very fast pacing. Very suspenseful. And Stephen Hand gave us just enough extra stuff to keep it fresh. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please let me know. I'd love to hear from you guys what you thought of this book. Uh, this was audiobook number 61 for the channel. Crazy, I know. Uh, I'll be back with uh, audiobook number 62 very soon. Going to be working on Event Horizon 
and Final Destination, Destination Zero. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and look out for jump scares, because honestly, folks, you never know when... (laughs) 